Well, welcome back to、uh, Communist Radio. This is episode six, and for today, I'm going to be the host. My name is Khaled Malakai, and I'm very glad to be joined by Georgina Ryan, who is a Central Committee comrade from、uh, from London, and has been building the RCP there. Yeah, well, hi, Cal. I'm very happy to be here. Hello, everyone who's listening. Yeah, great to have you on the show. I wanted to start with something that I saw on my phone screen a couple of nights back. It was the shocking, horrific image. Of a refugee camp that had been bombed by the Israelis, and of course we've seen over the past couple of weeks, and we've spoken about it on this podcast as well, just how、uh, Israel is really ramping up its massacre、um, at this moment in time. But I can't really remember seeing any words of condemnation coming out of、uh, Sir Keir Starmer or David Lammy. Did you see anything? Was it radio silence? I saw absolutely. I mean, you took the words right out of my mouth. It was radio silence. I saw nothing. I actually some act of of hatred towards myself. Clearly, I even went on、uh, David Lammy and、um, Keir Starmer's twitters yesterday just to see if they'd said absolutely anything. They hadn't. All I saw was, you know.、Uh, Tweets and comments that they've been making recently, renewing their support for Israel and its so-called right to defend itself. I've seen absolutely nothing on on Gaza, on Lebanon, nothing at all. Yeah, and Israel's massacre is really beginning to metastasize across the entire region, and I think our leaders have made it very clear they're happy for bombs and、uh, bombs to go to completely destroy schools and hospitals in Gaza, while schools and hospitals lay in a state of complete disrepair. In this country, and I think a lot of people this year have had many questions to ask about the political system. I mean, we had the election of Sir Keir Starmer's government this year, right? Which was meant to be one of stability, and、uh, all of a sudden, the chaos of the Tory years was meant to be behind us. But it's not really been that way, has it? No, not at all. And I think if you hadn't already seen fifteen years of Tory austerity, then you know we we wouldn't have. Uh, this this Keir Starmer government really, I think that's the only reason、um, it got elected. It was on a very low voter turnout. I think it was very clear from the beginning. People knew what this Starmer government would do. Right, the the writing was on the wall before they got elected. They weren't promising anything to the working class. I think if anything, it was a situation of people holding their noses and voting for Labour because they were so sick of the Tories.、Absolutely. No healthy appetite for them whatsoever. And、uh, there's been no honeymoon period. Uh, for this government at all, it's just been crisis from day one. No, yeah, I think that's completely true. And of course, we saw the far right running amok on the streets of Britain as well, feeling emboldened because of the kind of rhetoric that the Tory government was putting out. But of course, that the Labour government has aped as well before、Feeding、it even into got into these culture wars. Before it even got into power, yeah, I think that's exactly right. And with all of this chaos and instability in the world that's opening up, I think a lot of people are probably asking the question: Has the world gone mad? It's a good question, right? <laughs> It is a good question. Actually, I think you do see people come up to you. You know, if if you're out holding a copy of the Communist, or people, you know, even if they're not communists or they're they're not necessarily looking to join a communist organization, but they're coming up to you and they're asking you questions of what is going on. Yeah, and they're they're right to ask those questions because, of course, the country is going to pot. We've seen a continuation of the permanent austerity agenda of the、uh, of the Tory government. In the form of what Starmer is carrying out now, nothing but vicious attacks for the working class, and I think in all of this, sometimes people can see only one side of it. That being the doom and gloom. Most people our age do not really read the news. <laughs> they in fact avoid it unless they're looking for、uh, the lack of comment when it comes to the real issues that people face. But on the other hand, there is an enormous amount of radicalization taking place in society. And I've been thinking a lot about the the Kenyan revolution of the summer,、uh, where the youth in particular came out against this hated finance bill, really、uh, mounting a massive challenge to William Ruto's government. And they were saying, "Join the Gen Z revolution." That's what was、uh, the, the the famous hashtag on Twitter at the time. And I think what the situation today is really preparing is a new layer of class fighters that are looking for answers, looking for solutions to the issues that, that they face. And we can take inspiration from the role that the youth have played all across the world in coming out. We've seen the encampment movement, the movement in Bangladesh, the movement in Kenya as well. And it's in a situation like this that we're putting on the Revolution Festival. That's、uh, the the topic of discussion that we're going to be talking a little bit more in detail about throughout this、uh, this session of the podcast. And that's the backdrop backdrop to what we're talking about today. We're one month away from Revolution Festival now. 
and obviously you've been to Revolution Festival bef before, but I wanted to know, what makes it such a special time for us all to meet and discuss the ideas of Marxism? Yeah, I think, I mean, we've already outlined the world is on fire. It's crisis after crisis. And people are being radicalised as a result, as you've already said. But with this comes people wanting to be able to understand the world, understand what's taking place around us, you know. It's not enough for people just to be angry. People also want to do something about that and want to know how they can do something. And for us, this is what the Revolution Festival is, is really uniquely placed to be able to answer these questions. Yeah. It's our flagship education event that we have every year to answer questions, essentially, you know, for contemporary uh, questions of you know, sessions on uh, revolutions that have taken place and um, both historically and in and recently events that are happening around the world you know the climate crisis the US elections and everything that's going on there um, and for people to really be able to get a sense of understanding the world around them and and learning um, you know how how can we take all of this forward basically I think that's it I think that's the connection people are wanting to bridge First, understanding the world, but of course, not just to understand it in an academic way. It's in order to act. It's in order for our actions as a party really to be guided by theory. And Revolution Festival really fills that gap. Um, because I would say on the left, sometimes there is a disdain for theory. There is this idea that what we need to be doing is out on the streets week in, week out. And that alone is going to be enough to actually mount a challenge to uh, British imperialism. I think, firstly, what we need is to understand the world situation as it develops. In order to best explain these ideas, you gave the example before of people approaching us when we're selling the paper. So many people are looking towards the RCP at this moment in time and giving clear, concise ideas that point the way forward and show the strength that the working class has will be a really vital part, I think, of the Revolution Festival. And of course, we have 32 different sessions, which uh, there's a variety of topics. We're not going to be able to go into all of them today, of course, but uh, maybe we can have a bit of a flavor of what those sessions are. For instance, I know that Alan is going to be speaking at the plenary session on Friday night. Do you want to talk a little bit about what we can expect from that? Yeah, so that first session by Alan Woods, uh, anyone who has been to Revolution Festival or been to any of our events before will know he's a very, very fiery and intelligent speaker and I we can expect it to be an absolutely fantastic session. He'll be talking about essentially this renewed war and militarism around the world, um, the, this drive from the imperialist towards this and why it's happening, you know, why it's taking place, why... Um, there is so much war and violence around the world and talking about it and, you know, the major players on a global scale, who's involved and, you know, what are the aims and, you know, why it's all taking place, why genocide in Gaza, for example, is taking place. Actually, I think you have a talk specifically on the genocide in, in Gaza and or why, why is this happening? Do you want to tell us a bit about that? Yeah, well, um, preparations are underway for, for writing that talk at this moment in time. But I think it's um, it's been a real privilege to deep dive into the history of the conflict, to, to read a lot more than I had before, to really understand the nature of Israeli imperialism, because I think one of the key questions we have is how can Israel get away with what it does? And what does Zionism have to do with that? Because I think there is a lot of confused ideas, in fact, on the left as to why the US and Britain back Israel to the hilt. Um, they, there is this lack of understanding as to what Israel really represents for the imperialists, which, of course, as we explain, is an outpost for their interests. It doesn't always mean that it acts reliably for their interests. But um, I'm, I'm planning to go into a lot more detail as to really the nature of the Israeli regime, um, the 76 years of resistance that we have seen as well. Of course, resistance of the poor and oppressed really runs like a thread throughout the entire uh, entirety of the conflict. And one important thing as well is that situation in the Middle East is crying out for a revolutionary solution. I think that is so obvious to, to millions of people. And in fact, that's something that we could very likely see. The Arab Spring is still in the minds of, uh, it's in, in the consciousness of the Arab masses, where of course they were able to get rid of four dictators in a matter of a year. All of these security states that had been built up, that people couldn't remember any other politicians than figures like Hosni Mubarak in Egypt all of a sudden swept to one side when the masses came out onto the streets. But there are key lessons that we can, of course, learn about um, the need for a revolutionary leadership, the inability to improvise in the heat of revolutionary fervor as well. 
So I'm going to be looking a little bit at um, the revolutionary potential that exists within the Middle East as well. I think we do have a session on the Arab Spring as well, we which will go into that in a lot more detail. Because I mean, ultimately, I mean, you think you just pointed to it with raises the question of leadership and we're seeing yes they did sweep away um, multiple regimes corrupt regimes but power has not changed hands like these these countries are left with the same burdening questions and as a result uh, all of this revolutionary potential still exists uh, amongst uh, the masses in these countries absolutely and their hearts bleed for palestine palestine really has become um, the key issue i think on the minds of people not just in the arab world but across the world um, because, of course, it shows just how far the imperialists will go to protect their interests. It shows really the stinking hypocrisy of the United States and Britain, of all of these rulers that step up to the podium and talk about the high and lofty values of democracy, freedom, humanitarian aims, and so on and so forth. And it's just a load of rubbish. People can really see through that. And just on the note of revolutions, obviously, we've seen the revolution in Bangladesh. Uh, and we're going to have a session on that this year, uh, which is really exciting, I would say, because in East London, where there is a massive Bangladeshi diaspora, on the day that Sheikh Hasina was overthrown, it felt like a revolution. You were there, right? It was absolutely fantastic. You know, went down to, to Whitechapel and um, just, you know, to see what was going on. And honestly, it was like a festival. It felt like a revolution was taking place, it was honestly, like a party, you know. Thousands and thousands of people out on the streets celebrating, you know, that um, and you can see how, you know, events are c connected internationally, right? Like uh, people in Britain, um, of course, many of whom are Bangladeshi themselves, but they are so they were so inspired about what was what was taking place and so happy about what what had taken place, bringing down um, the rotten government of Hasina after her 16 year dictatorship. Um, it, it was truly inspiring. It felt like a mini revolution taking place. Um, in East London, the mood was, was absolutely electric. Absolutely, absolutely. So we'll be discussing the unfinished revolution in 1971. Yeah, long revolutionary history in Bangladesh, not yes. its first revolution. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And talking about revolution and revolutionary potential, why don't we talk about the belly of the beast, the United States of America? Yeah. <laughs> where, of course, as you said, I think right at the beginning, two weeks will have passed since the election of either Trump or Kamala Harris. And we're going to have uh, Antonio Obama Join us uh, to discuss the political situation there and the next chapter in the crisis of US imperialism. Certainly, who, whoever wins um, this election, it, it's certainly going to be a crisis-filled period. And I think for, you know, just uh, similar to the situation with uh, hasn't really made a difference, Starmer being elected, for example, in Britain in terms of where, where Britain is going. Um, I think lots of ordinary Americans can already see that their choices are imperialism or imperialism, bloodshed or bloodshed. There's no, um, you know, for left-wing people, for young people in the US, there's, there's no alternative to these two terrible, terrible uh, bourgeois parties. Yes, yeah. The most powerful democracy yes. in, in, the, in the world. <laughs> the, the sham land, of bourgeois democracy. Absolutely, being exposed in front of so many people's eyes. The land of the free should be the land of the slave. And I think so many people in, um, in America are looking for revolutionary alternatives. Of course, we're going to be hearing about the work of our comrades from the Revolutionary Communist of, of America. And they've been growing massively. They uh, have. And, and yeah, I love hearing reports from all the work that they've been doing. Yeah, I've been following their, their website and uh, getting my hands on the copies of their papers. I think it's called The Communist, just like yeah. ours, <laughs> uh, whenever I've had the chance. Because, of course, that situation is crying out for a revolutionary organization to be built. And it's going to open up a really great opportunity for us to speak with communists from all across the world as well. We've mentioned that, um, of course, people in Britain come together for this political event, for this anti-imperialist conference, which we're styling the Saturday as. We're going to have Fiona, our national spokesperson, speaking on the Books Not Bombs campaign and how that has been going. And we're obviously going to hear from all of these comrades from different countries that are coming along and that have been carrying out the exact same campaign, agitating against their ruling class, saying that the main enemy is at home and really um, trying to, to sink roots into different schools, workplaces, uh, universities and planting the flag of communism. So we're going to hear all about um, 
how they've been getting on as well. Yeah, I think last time I checked, we'd sold tickets for countries all across Europe and the US, from Canada, Taiwan as well. But I'm sure that as, as time goes on, more, more people from around the world will be finalising their accommodation, getting their tickets and getting themselves over here. I think we've in total sold something like 600 tickets so far. Um, I think we nearly reached a thousand at last year's Revolution Festival, if I remember correctly, and um, we're hoping to smash that this year. Yeah, I think we can be confident that we will smash Definitely. it. And we can come on a little bit later to how we're building for it here in London in particular, how the comrades are politically preparing. But before we get there, we've spoken a lot about the imperialist bloodshed that is uh, spilling all across the Middle East, the wars, the remilitarization drive that is taking place globally, and of course, we are, um, we are going to be discussing uh, anti-imperialism, but we're not just anti-imperialists as communists. There are many other topics that we are be going to be discussing. And so it's a school of communism as well with you know, a one-day feature on anti-imperialism with other talks as well. And uh, I just wanted to uh, ask you about the Lenin year because, of course, it's the centenary of Lenin's death. Lenin, who, of course, is uh, one of the greatest Marxists that ever lived, the man who turned the ideas of Marxism into a living reality with the vast support of the working class and peasantry of Russia, they not only succeeded in setting up a workers' state, but defending its gains as well by fighting off the, uh, the imperialists during the Russian Civil War. So we're going to be discussing a lot about the ideas of Lenin as well. That continues from, again, as you say, the Lenin year that we've been having, a theme throughout the year. I don't know if uh, our audience can see uh, the, the books behind us. Um, sorry for those of you who are listening, um, but behind us, our backdrop today is um, our In Defense of Lenin uh, two-part series um, that we published this year. Uh, essentially, you know, this is part of us reclaiming the legacy uh, of Lenin, defending the legacy of Lenin, of who this man really was, you know, standing up to all the lies um, that the ruling class um, have about Lenin and, and actually who he was. And we've published a whole host of other materials as well, like Lenin's uh, writings on war and imperialism. And, and even more recently, we've published um, one on Lenin and the 1917 revolution, a collection of writings around that. Really looking forward to reading that one, haven't managed to yet. We've been putting out so many good books that it's, it's sometimes hard to keep up, right? <laughs> For sure. And of course, we're going to have both Rob Saul and Alan Wood speaking at the event, who are the co-authors of the In Defense of Lenin book that you can see behind you uh, if, you're, if you're watching online. And uh, there are a variety of sessions where we're going to go into a little bit more detail. I'm really looking forward to the sessions where it discusses how the Bolshevik party was built. Because I think we'll be going back to what is to be done, the real fundamentals of Bolshevism, where Lenin said that there is no room for amateurism in building a revolutionary party. What we're after is professional revolutionaries. What, that he, what, what he meant by that was not simply people on the payroll of the revolutionary party. He meant people that are caders, people that fundamentally understand the, the world situation, can adjust to different political situations and can lead. Because of course, the world as we've been describing earlier is one of sharp and sudden changes at this moment in time. And what we really fundamentally need is cadres, political leaders, people that can size up situations and understand where we can basically make gains and what slogan we need to in order to connect with what's taking place in the world. So I think that session will be fantastic. There's other sessions as well on the year of 1917 and how Lenin's Bolshevik party navigated the very tricky terrain of the political situation changing so suddenly in, uh, in 1917 itself, with, of course, the February Revolution being led by the working class and the peasantry, later being co-opted by uh, the liberal bourgeois, the provisional government, the Mensheviks, and so on, and how he was able to skillfully use slogans and connect to the masses in order to complete that revolution in October and, of course, change the world in doing so. I think there's a session as well on... Um... Uh, Lenin and the Second International, which I think is is also very, very relevant for the time that we're in. Um, so the, the Second International uh, collapsed around the outbreak of, of war because the, all these social democrats, these so-called socialists, completely bowed down to the pressures of imperialism and went to the side of their own ruling classes, betraying not only their own working class, but the international working class as well, um, by, by standing behind their own national bourgeoisies um, in, in this imperialist war, the, the First World War. 
And this, this of course, you know, in this renewed uh, drive towards war and militarism that we're seeing opening up on the world stage today, uh, this, this poses the question for communists of how do we relate to, to war? Like, how, mm. how do we position ourselves? And, and ultimately, as communists, what is needed is, is what is needed for the interests of the international working class as a whole. And how do we do that? Of course, building an international is, is something um, it, but very, very necessary. And Lenin talks about this, of course, as well. Like, declared the second international to be dead because they'd proven that they weren't uh, internationalists. Yeah, they weren't up to task. And... Um... Yeah, you're definitely right that war tests socialists and communists like nothing else. And we've seen so many strange positions come out of the variety of wars yes. <laughs> that, the world, that, that the world is currently going through by um, other political tendencies, other political groups. So it'd be really good to clarify that and go back to the basics. By basics, we mean Lenin. <laughs> um, Got and a of lot course, to learn from that man. We do, we do. And of course, there are going to be key talks on the, on the pillars of Marxism as well for people that have just recently joined the organization. We're going to have talks on philosophy. Um, the history of philosophy is a session I'm really looking forward to, to really understand how human thought has developed, how all of these seemingly contradictory and um, different philosophies over time have completed one another as we get closer and closer to really understanding the world and our relationship to it. I think that's going to be a fantastic session. There's also some sessions on economics as well, and one that I'm looking forward to out of that uh, lot is the post-war boom, looking basically at how the inherent contradictions of capitalism came to the fore in the 1970s in, in a massive crisis, of course, sparked by issues in the Middle East, but of course, unraveling a lot of the hidden contradictions that were there, built into the system uh, that were got around and softened during the post-war boom. And history as well, I think that's a really important cornerstone of Marxist theory. Understanding history, how can we understand the world around us? What role does the class struggle play within that? So I think there's something for everyone when it comes to Revolution Festival. All of the key pillars, the back to Lenin emphasis, the anti-imperialist conference on Saturday, it's a bargain. It's £40 for the weekend, right? I know. <laughs> Cheapest weekend you can have in London, for sure. Yes, yes. And of course, the London organisation has a special responsibility to... Uh, to get out on the streets and make sure we make a splash and get as many people there as possible. And I wanted to ask, how are the comrades in the branches preparing politically for the Revolution Festival? I think the, f the first thing to talk about really is the political preparation that branches are taking, which, which is certainly key. And we've already discussed, you know, in order to be able to change the world, we have to understand it. And, and that's one of the reasons we're having this revolution festival, for us to be able to understand what is taking place using theory as our guide to action. But we want comrades to be able to, be able to participate in, in the discussions um, and the talks to the greatest level that they possibly can. Um, so comrades in branches are you know, preparing. Um, we've got on the revolution festival website um, for everybody who might not already know this, there's very handy links to lots of suggested reading materials before the sessions. So this this will help you go into the sessions with a greater understanding of what they're they're going to be about. Can help you kind of participate in it more. And this is something that we're really encouraging in the branches uh, for people to be able to politically prepare uh, in this way. Um, you know, for branches, there's, as you said, there's 32 sessions, and some they do. Um, many go over each other right there there's three or four on at a time uh, at any one time but that's fine you know um you and the people in your branch can sit down together and just decide which ones you're going to and be a brilliant basis for future discussions yeah. um report them back to each other really you know even more understanding like test that you can understand it yourself by by kind of rehashing it and uh, making it your own and giving a, your own talk on it to your branch absolutely and it's a good job they're all recorded because yeah, of uh, course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are so many con uh, competing sessions that uh, i haven't even really decided which ones i'll be going Very to yet to choose i can barely keep up with the notes uh, it's, it's there's too much amazing things being said at once to go back absolutely and from the the conversations i've had with comrades not just in london but across the country it seems like we're gearing up for a big week of postering as well, all around campuses, getting people that are looking to join the organization involved and feeling ownership over this event, which will be very significant. And there's one anecdote I had from this past weekend where I met a new comrade in London. I think he's in the Farringdon branch. And he came across us through a poster or a social media post, something like this. 
he had a couple of conversations with one of our comrades and then he found his way into a branch he's at city university and he wants to build he after basically a few conversations he's realized that the best thing he can do with his time uh, and i would recommend this for all university students is to build a marxist cell at your university which is focused on political discussion and what action you can do on campus and i've met this group of people he has around him now and it really shows the power of ideas and i think all of that really comes together and culminates in the revolution festival uh, every single year because everyone can remember their first revolution festival <laughs> it leaves a lasting impact on on the yes. comrades that have attended and I think that all comes down to the revolutionary ideas that you have on display where you see the depth and breadth of understanding throughout the entire organization. Of course, the, um, the, the list of talks is very carefully curated with, uh, with thought going to what is needed for communists, what is needed for this next generation of fighters to really understand in order to really aid the work as, the, as the, we, we kind of kick off into the new year. And so I just wanted to end on this note because, of course, we've spoken a little bit about Lenin and there's a famous, uh, if not immortal, Lenin quote, without revolutionary theory, there is no revolutionary movement. That seems to be the, the kind of guiding reason why, of course, we put on events such as the Revolution Festival. Certainly, I agree. Yeah, and um, the importance of ideas, I think, could be no clearer in a time like this because we're seeing mass movement after mass movement break out onto the streets of London, break out onto the streets of Dhaka, break out to the streets of everywhere. And more often than not, people know what they are against, but they don't quite know what they are fighting for just yet. And of course, that's where a revolutionary party with revolutionary ideas can really begin to make inroads, can really begin to make an impact. And I think that is what the Revolution Festival is for. It's for arming this new class of, uh, of fighters within our ranks educating the organization collectively and on the basis of a much better understanding of the world uh, we will have a much better understanding of how to fight our enemy how to fight imperialism how to model ourselves on the bolsheviks which are of course a massive inspiration for us as communists so if you haven't already i would recommend for everyone to buy their uh, ticket at revolutionfestival.co.uk and we hope to see you there thank you so much for joining me georgina no problem thank you very much